Okay, this is my fifth response to the CES letter. Again, let me reiterate that this is my own personal opinions and answers to the issues raised. This should not be taken as an official source of church doctrine, nor am I speaking for the church leadership. So this is my, my fifth video. We are still in section one, titled Book of Mormon, issue number five states. Anachronisms such as horses, cattle, oxen, sheep, swine, goats, elephants, wheels, chariots, wheat, silk, steel, and iron did not exist in pre-Columbian America during Book of Mormon times. Why are these things mentioned in the Book of Mormon as being made available in the Americas between 2200 BC and 421 AD? So, first of all, what is an anachronism? An anachronism, to put it briefly, is something that is out of place either in time or location. We see this frequently in movies where they make a period piece, such as, you know, make a movie set in the 1800s, but they put electric lights in before electric lights were actually invented. Things of this nature. When we are looking at historical records, or claims of historical records, the presence of an anachronism can indicate that a given document is a forgery, or could also indicate simply that it is not from the time period from which it is claimed. This criticism of the Book of Mormon takes things that the Book of Mormon mentions and claims that because scholars haven't found them, or scholars say that they were not, they did not exist in the Americas at the t during the time that the Book of Mormon takes place in, that these then are anachronisms. They are things that are out of place for the time period that the Book of Mormon covers. Now, I'm not going to address each individual anachronism that is mentioned in the letter or any other ones. I am going to simply address the concept of anachronisms and why this does not affect the Book of Mormon's authenticity or, one, <clears throat> or my faith in it. So having said that, I would like to speak on three different points regarding anachronisms. First point is this issue much like issue number one, which I have already made the video for and I will put a link to in the description, what this is really saying is why don't the scriptures agree with modern scholars? That's the basic gist of the issue being raised. Scholars say these things didn't exist, the Book of Mormon says they did exist, why does the Book of Mormon disagree with modern scholars? This goes back again to my introduction and the five truths that I listed as the anchor of my faith. Truth number four states, the scriptures are the word of God. These are inspired by God. They are his word given to his prophets. Therefore, they are the standard by which everything else is judged. Not just doctrine of the church, but everything. And so, my question is, why should I believe modern scholars rather than the scriptures? The scriptures are given to us by God, so I trust God. And if the scholars disagree, then the scholars must be wrong. Why should I trust men rather than trusting God? However, we do want to look at the case of anachronisms and actually give a response to it. As Peter says, we should, or was it Paul? I can't remember. But one of them said that we should always be ready to give an answer for our faith. And so here now is my answer. First of all, for something to be an anachronism, it has to be out of place, meaning that it did not, did not exist in the time and place that it is being presented. All of these things that are mentioned in the letter, and all the things that people mention as being anachronisms in the Book of Mormon. Their claim is 
Archaeologists and scientists have not found evidence for it, therefore it didn't exist. We haven't found evidence of, say, horses, therefore horses didn't exist. The problem with this is that it, is, it does not flow logically. And as the saying goes, absence of proof is not proof of absence. In other words, just because we haven't found it yet doesn't mean it didn't exist. We simply haven't found it. Now this was illustrated very well back in 2005 by a John Blake and a couple of his colleagues where they presented a table that listed all the supposed uh, anachronisms that, well not all, they listed a table of 60, sorry, they listed a table of 60 anachronisms. And then they compared what we knew in 1842, when Joseph Smith was still alive, to what we now know, or what we knew in 2005 when they made this presentation. Now of these 60 anachronisms, in 1842, which would be about 12 years after the Book of Mormon was published, 13%, about 8, had already been confirmed, had already been found and shown to be authentic. By 2005, of those 60 supposed anachronisms, 60% had been confirmed as being accurate. Another 15% is what they would call trending or kind of on its way to being confirmed where the scientists are now saying that it is possible they had it but we have not yet directly confirmed it. So we have 60% has been confirmed, 15% is, is possible or likely to have existed that is, 75% of these 60 supposed anachronisms have now been proven to not be anachronisms, but to be accurate to the time period of the Book of Mormon. Uh, well, one of John Blake's colleagues, a Matthew Roper, he decided to do a more in-depth study of this issue, and in 2019 he presented his findings. And he goes back, he basically repeats what was back in 1842, but he does two steps instead of just one. He goes to 1965. He said, in, in 1965, there were 150 claims of anachronisms in the Book of Mormon. 150. 15% had been confirmed as accurate by 1965. He then looked at 2019. And we've added a lot more claims of anachronisms because he now lists 205 possible anachronisms. And of that 205, 69% have been confirmed. Another 22% are in the possible or likely to be confirmed category for a total of 81%. Those with faith all we have to do is sit back and wait because time has vindicated the Book of Mormon and Joseph Smith over and over and we just need to wait for it to finish. The evidence is there. We will find it eventually. And I would also point out that Joseph Smith wrote the Book of Mormon. He translated the Book of Mormon in 1830 almost 200 years ago. And before any scholars had confirmed any of these things, and yet he got so much right. But my third point is simply that none of this actually matters. When we are discussing the Book of Mormon in terms of archaeology or history or those similar disciplines as this claim is, using anachronisms and all that. If we are discussing it with somebody who believes, they're not going to care. They're going to say, as I have, that time will prove the Book of Mormon true. If you're discussing with somebody who doesn't want to believe, and is generally those who present an argument such as this, are those 
who don't really want to believe, they are trying to find a reason not to believe, nothing you say is ever going to convince them. Archaeology is one of those what I call gotcha issues, where somebody, they don't want to believe and so they latch onto archaeology and say, well, I can always prove it false through archaeology, which you can't. If you actually look at what, at the, what the record is, what the archaeology is, archaeology is constantly proving the Book of Mormon true. But the way they do this is by always limiting what they are willing to accept as evidence in support of the Book of Mormon. One good example, I was in a discussion with a young woman, I honestly don't know how old she was, but, and it was online, so. But, we were in this discussion, and I mentioned barley as an example. See, barley is mentioned in the Book of Mormon, and it was, at one point, called an anachronism. But then, I believe it was in the 1990s, they found barley. Ancient barley. And so they say, well, they did have barley. It said, we found it. People would then say, it's not cultivated. But then, just a few years later, they found cultivated barley. So now we have proof of cultivated barley. And then the argument changed again to, well, it's not old world barley, you see. It has to be the barley that was grown in the Middle East, or it doesn't count. And that's what I mean by always finding a reason to disbelieve. And what they do, and it's uh, in debate, it's what's called changing the goalposts. You're always shifting what you require. First they said there was no barley, but once it was found, well, they had a shift to cultivated barley. Then they had a shift to old world barley. And they constantly do it because they don't want to believe. There's always some reason not to believe, and they will always find it. Those who don't want to believe will never be satisfied with archaeology or any science, while those who believe don't care. Now, on this last point, I would point out that the CES letter does this exact thing that I have just explained. Because after that initial point, which I read at the beginning of the video, they then make the following statement. Unofficial apologists claim victories in some of these items, by closer ins but closer inspection reveals significant problems. It has been documented that apologists have manipulated wording so that steel is not steel, sheep become never domesticated bighorn sheep, horses become tapirs, etc. What this is saying is, it doesn't matter what evidence anybody comes up with, we are going to reject it. That is the purpose of this. They are kind of putting this in as a preemptive statement of, we're just not going to believe that, no matter what you do. So don't try to convince us, because we're not going to be convinced. And so we, we can see, even in the letter, they have this very rigid and limited acceptance of what they will consider evidence and therefore again it doesn't matter once somebody brings up archaeology the reason they bring it up is to end the conversation if they don't want to believe it doesn't matter what you say they're not going to and you can know this when they bring up archaeology because archaeology as I said is that gotcha issue they can always say, I got you with this one, therefore I'm not going to believe. Because they will always find a reason to reject any evidence you may present. So, again, on this issue, I return to that fourth truth. The scriptures are the word of God, and I trust God more than I trust men. And so it doesn't matter to me what the scholars say. I will believe what the Book of Mormon says. But, as time goes on, that faith is constantly being vindicated by the frequent discoveries that are being made that show the accuracy of the Book of Mormon, written two, nearly 200 years ago, during a time when almost none of this was known.